everybody. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? There we go. A little bit more light in Let's here. Put some it's light kind of on dark and lighter outside. I think they're big storms just northwest of us. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to get any. We got so much rain and hail on, what was it, Thursday night? Thursday night. We got three and a half inches of rain. It was Two crazy. rounds of hail. <laughs> Not big enough to do <laughs> kinda, any damage. but kinda, Yeah, just little <clears throat> bitty ones, but that'll probably hold us well. So we're glad all of y'all are here today. Yes. On this Sunday. Are, this, are we finishing up today? Today is our last <clears throat> Sunday to go to Israel. Sure enough is. But you can still actually go to Israel. With yes, us. we have a few seats. <laughs> uh, we, we have some seats. There's, you know, we're, Not we, many, we can take about ninety, and I think we have like eighty-two right now. So if you know somebody who wants to come, I am really my confidence factor in the trip happening is going up, 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 up. That's a great thing. Israel, Israel's well on the road to vaccinating everybody over there. I think we will be there by this. Early early summer, we all have vaccinated everybody who's willing right. to be vaccinated. It is it is possible Israel will require you to have been vaccinated to enter the country. So that for all the people on the trip, just just bear that in mind. But yeah, I'm getting more optimistic all the time. I'm so looking forward to it because of course we thought we would have already gone and been back five months ago. But see, that's right. Now we is, have something to look forward to. So that's good. So, and if. I know we have some trip people who have been participating in this class. All the videos for this this whole seven week series, they're all on YouTube, at on my YouTube channel. And that is all in, the the links are all in the Friday email I send out every week. And um, if you miss one, I really urge you to go back and look at it because I can't think of a better way to prep for the class right. than just to sit through. I know, I know it's seven hours of viewing at this point, but but, it will really help you get ready for the trip and kind of see where you're going. Where you're going. So anyway, we're today we're back, and if you can't go to Israel, as most people can't, right? Okay, this right. series I think has been a good little bit of a you are there experience, and I'll try yes. to try to do that some more today. Absolutely. So, what do you think? Any interesting thing to say to us today, Patty? Um, Is Denny Hamlin going to win this <gasps> afternoon? Yeah, as you all know, I am the big NASCAR <laughs> fan, so I certainly hope Denny Hamlin's going to win. came out of like win. nowhere. This is all COVID nineteen related. Oh, not well. And right, also, well, your brother, I know, he was a big, big. My brother big was car, a huge NASCAR fan. I mean, it was like for him to go to the races; it would be a big, big deal. Yeah. Well, you know, one of my best friends growing up, back in the. Uh, this would have been in the early 60s. His father was a NASCAR driver back in the 50s. Wow. Way when it was just getting started, and he was killed. Not in a race car. Ray's dad was killed playing poker on a boat on Caddo Lake and was struck by lightning. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? Yep, yep. So Ray's family, they were all big, big well, car people. Wow. And for a while, Ray owned that... Um, racetrack that was over in east texas on the way to Shreveport, hill hilltop or something so wow. i don't know anyway wow. enough of that they don't care about this stuff <laughs> <laughs> they hear you talking about ray dancy though all the time yeah. because yeah. he was one of your best friends yeah. as a little kid he was the one who invited me to go to the clan meeting with him and his oh uncle. okay yeah, that was right Okay. How did he also <laughs> did he also take you to the revival? To the revival see, also. See the yes. same child. Do you see yes. how one child can have? <laughs> <laughs> I did go to the revival. I did not go to the clan meeting. Thank the Lord for that. Um, okay. Anyway, especially in this cancel culture now. Oh my! Can you imagine? Gosh, somebody would. Yeah. Yes, it's it's scary. It you is know, really scary. Yeah. I wonder if people are going to. Fifty-five go years ago, <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay let's pray 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 with me please gracious lord we are grateful to be here on this sunday and and we appreciate the fact that we can gather like this even though we have to do it online it's it's we so look forward to the day when we are back together in smith worship center and able to enjoy the fellowship and see one another and hug one another and and just do just do all the stuff that we that we have grown to love over the years and we pray this morning that you would hold us together that your holy spirit would um, guide us as we make our way through this last sunday in israel all this we pray in Jesus' name amen amen and how exciting is it going to be that even though it may be a little bit distanced 
we are going to be able to see a lot of people on Easter morning. That is pretty cool. That was so yeah, cool. So cool. Awesome. Rough Rider Stadium Easter morning and the Saturday evening before. So there's there's services Saturday evening and services Sunday morning and um, you know I think most of us will be there. All of us who can will be there. I think it'll be a hoot. It'll be a great way, a great way to do Easter and, and look forward to the day. You know, I hope in the not too distant future when we're all re able to be back together again. Um, so, in any event, here we are for the last trip to Israel, right? So, let me pull up some of my slides. All right, so. Scott, I'm so sorry. Did you want to mention um, one thing now again about um, restocking our basket fund watch my slides oh sorry you acted like you were just going right into class <laughs> no so. well we are uh, what i am starting the slide deck is actually what's happening so i sent a note out friday to the sunday morning class about needing to refill our missions basket and the fact that you know we do real well on the special collections but just the regular money that the missions committee has to work with is kind of diminished and we have a lot of immediate needs that we try to respond to. So if you could help us do that, that would be great. Um, you can do it online um, by just putting Scott Engel Sunday class in the memo line, hitting give once, put in however much you would like to donate. You could, if you go to worship on Sunday morning or Saturday night, you can drop a check, just make it clear in the memo line what it's for, um, or you could mail it into the church. But I suspect many of us are doing this online now. So, um, in any event, we would appreciate your help with that. Okay, so let's plunge in. This is a great illustration I used a few weeks ago. I want to come back to it because I really want to make sure that as we wrap up this series that we all have a pretty good mental image of Jerusalem. Of Israel, yes, but of especially Jerusalem because it will really... It will really help the Gospels come alive for you, right? When, when you're told in the Gospels that Jesus goes to the pools of Bethesda, you can picture it, and you know where it is in Jerusalem, and it would just make it all more concrete, more real. Because I think, at least for me, growing up, I mean, I heard the stories, but it was all... None of it seemed like... It was something that actually, you know, really happened like, you know, things that happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But when you see photos and maps or you're able to go or and put the pieces together, when you're able to do that, ah, then it becomes very, very real. So here is this great illustration of two things. The white arrow is pointing toward the temple that Solomon built. On the lower level walled is the city of David. So when David captures Jerusalem, what he captures about a thousand years before Jesus is that lower portion. And then under Solomon, they build northward and erect that temple up there. Okay, leaving this Jerusalem then being the entire, the entire piece. Still relatively, still relatively small, right? It's however many people you can cram inside those those city walls. So here is the model of Jerusalem um, that is at the Israel Museum, and I put a red arrow in there, pointing to what the city of David, that keyhole shaped very narrow and long walled city that David conquered. Is that clear? So if we go back to this one, you see at the lower level there? It's really tiny. It's really tiny. Because look look northward, look look on the north end of the city of David and you see the Temple Mount. The Temple That's, Mount actually looks bigger <laughs> yeah, than the it whole does. city of David. It does. Because and the reason it can be bigger is because whoop, let me back up. What Herod did was he knocked, he took a lot of dirt from surrounding hilltops and filled in the valleys to give him a lot more land on which to build this enormous Temple Mount. 
and then that's how the city expanded across these valleys and stuff. They basically filled it in, and you end up with something like yes. But that's the city of David right there. On we're looking north, so this is that is on the eastern side of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. And we'll see in a minute, the Kidron Valley runs down that eastern side. Just It's the valley that nestles up against the eastern walls there. Okay? So I brought this picture just for sentimental sake for those of us who know Helen Maston and New John, her husband who passed away a few years ago. I took, um, Pat, Patty, I, I think, took this. We're again looking north <laughs> over the model. There's John and Helen Maston. Um, you can see the city of David, and of course, dominating everything is is the Temple Mount, which was Herod's objective, right? Herod's objective was to ingratiate himself to the Jewish people as their local king um, under the r ultimate rule of, of Rome. But he wanted, he wanted to build something grand, and so he did. He built something that dominated. He built... Uh, really an ancient wonder and people traveled to Jerusalem just to see the Temple Mount and the temple structure that Herod had built there. So here's my favorite little map again so you can see the Temple Mount. The map does not show the city of David on it um, but it would extend southward toward I, the bottom of the map. I just want to add one tiny little yeah. thing about that picture of John and Helen. Yeah. Um, some of the people online were with us that trip. This this is not that long ago. This is just a few years ago. Yeah. They were both close to 90 yeah. years old. Yeah. And they did everything. Yeah. I would sometimes turn around and say, John, this is going to be really difficult. You might want to sit here. But I would turn around halfway up the mountain, and he'd be right <laughs> behind me. So it, yep. it was such a joy how, how much was. they got out he of that He was determined. Trip. John was determined to see everything. Everything, yes. And he did. He sure enough did. Um, so this is the map of Jerusalem of Jesus' day that we've been using, and we're going to use some more, I think. Uh, um, no, we're actually we're not going to use it much today because we're leaving Jerusalem. But this is the map we've been using. Um, this is a photograph of the model that the church owns. This was a model donated to the church by my Sunday morning class. Um, Larry Phillips built a big, gorgeous wooden case for it to sit on. Um, and it's under glass, and it sits near the bridge across the campus. Of course, nobody's seen it hardly for a year, but there it is. And I put numbers on it just so you can begin to put, to just cement in your mind how this city worked. So let's just go through the numbers clockwise. One is Herod's Palace, big and beautiful, probably where Pontius Pilate was when he tried Jesus. Two, Golgotha right there just outside the city walls on the main road leading out of the city to the to the west that's where today the church of the holy sepulcher stands and has stood since queen helena um came to the holy land in the fourth century number three is the garden of gethsemane it's nestled right there um in the kidron valley it is looks it looks up at the eastern wall of the Temple Mount and the city and um, anybody standing in the Garden of Gethsemane would be able to see the arresting party that comes down the hillside out of the city comes down to look for Jesus so and right behind the Garden of Gethsemane along there's this ridge number four called the Mount of Olives which, for example, in the Gospels, Jesus climbs up the Mount of Olives with his disciples and sits down, this is um, in, the, in Holy Week, as we call it, and looks over Jerusalem and basically weeps for it. And he's, he sees what's coming um, if they insist upon grasping for, grasping for power, um, striving to get rid of the Romans and, and the rest. So... 
Verse number four is the Mount of Olives. Number five is the Kidron Valley that runs down the whole eastern side of the city. Number six is the city of David. You can see a faint little outline of it, I think, on the model if you look really closely. But it just, you know, it just points southward from the Temple Mount. And that was the original city conquered by David about roughly a thousand years before Jesus. Number seven, we haven't talked about much. That is the Hinnom Valley, H-I-N-N-O-M. Um, it's a valley that has a dark reputation. It was the... Um, the trash heap of Jerusalem in Jesus' day. It is a place where um, people had practiced human sacrifice in the past. It was, um, you know, and so it, 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 a lot of times when Jesus talks about hell, what he's actually talking about, and even in the Greek, is Gehana, Gehana, Gehinnom. This is the valley that is Gehana that Jesus talks about. Like, it's the last place you'd want to be. So anyway, that's it. You know, I urge you to, you know, spend some time just familiarizing yourself with some of that. When we get to the end of class today, I am going to recommend a resource. If you really want to kind of put this in your in your mind, and you can really do that. Even if you can't go, it, you can. I remember um, we first Patty and I first went to Israel in 2007 with a group of about 30. I don't think we had any notion we would ever go back. I spent a lot of time prepping for that trip. And I remember the guide we had was pretty amazed that I had never been there. But I had simply used all we have, all the resources we have today. We have photos, we have maps, the internet is stuffed with resources. Um, that you can use to begin to know this place, even though you might not have the chance to go. So that's what I hope some of you might want to do. All right. So we're going to visit a few places today that are in the vicinity of Jerusalem. If you, What I've done with this map is these two maps are identical, except the one on your right has... The red, the red lines are the boundaries of the West Bank today, right? This whole area is partitioned up, and the West Bank is the area in encircled in red there, okay? it's Actually, the whole thing is much more complicated than it appears on a map because then there are areas B, area, areas A, areas B, areas C, about who can go where and who controls what, and oh my gosh. You know, it's pretty amazing and a little boring, actually, to get the guides to talk about it. So if you look at the white arrows, you will see that we are going to make the trek now from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is only about five miles or so, six miles, seven miles south of Jerusalem. It's not, a, it's not very far, but look at the red line. The red line in the map to the right lies between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So if you make the trek to Bethlehem, you have to cross into the West Bank, which means a couple of things. First of all, you, our Israeli guides can't go with us. We pick up Palestinian guides at the border between Israel and the West Bank. And the bus drive, the buses go, the drivers can go, but the guides can't. So we pick up Palestinian guides and make our way in. And then you have to go through a... The bus just goes through a, a, a checkpoint. You don't actually have to go through it as individuals. Um, but the bus goes through a checkpoint going in and coming out. Um, and it's just how they do it. It's how they try to maintain security over there. So we're going to go to Bethlehem in the West Bank. And before we get there, we're going to visit a place called Herodium that you may never heard or have heard of. Many people have not heard of Herodium. So we're going to stop there, though. And the reason is we're stopping there not because Herodium is in your Bible, but because it helps us understand this important figure, Herod the Great. Herod is a builder. 
He's a builder, builder, builder. He built Caesarea Maritima. He built the Temple Mount, the huge temple in Jerusalem. He has built the palace that became Masada, okay? Um, and he built Herodium. And here's what Herodium is. It is in the distance. It's just like you're driving on the highway. And there it is. It's like this mountain that arises out of the land. I think I have another one. Yeah, it's this mountain that arises. The whole thing is man-made. There is no mountain there. It's this gigantic structure, a mountain basically, built built by it's one of Herod the Great's constructions. Um, and when you visit it, Today, there's a road leading to the top. The buses get up to the where that arrow is pointing, and then you can walk the rest of the way, which Patty and I have done. I have a few photos, I think, Patty took. And you can see in the top of what is almost looks like a, vo a volcano, that is a palace fortification structure that, that Herod built. And um, uh, so it's really all all quite amazing and there are a lot of stories about you know where Herod is buried and perhaps he's he's buried there um, and that was the purpose of this but and just it's huge it's Once just it's there. just huge yes you, you know see. it's hard for the pictures you to see how convey. tiny the cars are though down in the parking lot <laughs> just to get the scale. yeah you can hardly even see the cars down there so you walk up to the top and Looking down in the top, there's just there's just lots of structures and old ruined stuff. Of course, you know that's that's what we're talking about here, and uh, it's it's like Masada in that way. Masada, the ruins of Masada are the ruins of the fortress and palace that Herod built there, and the same same thing with Herodium. It's just. It's and, and when we've been there, the, especially the last trip, they were in the middle of a big excavation project up there at the top. I remember bulldozers and all kinds of stuff that that they were was working happening. on and uncovering things and studying it. And there's, you know, uh, it's just it's just fascinating to me that this whole thing was just constructed there two thousand years ago. Just out of the, out of these flat plains, so wow, pretty wild if you ask me. Okay, whoop, there I go. Okay, so now we're gonna get back on the bus and we're gonna go to Bethlehem. So Bethlehem, okay. So Bethlehem is obviously the place where Jesus was born. It is a big, big, it's a thriving city today. Um. In Jesus' day, it was a village. Again, I've, I've talked at length in the past about population estimates. Those are hard to come by. It's a small, it's a small village south of Jerusalem. Its prominence in the biblical story really begins with the story of Samuel. When Samuel goes to the home of Jesse, to find a king for Israel because King Saul hasn't worked out. So this is, again, roughly, just roughly, a thousand years before Jesus. And Samuel goes to, to Jesse's home and he looks over all Jesse's sons and none of them seem to be the one he's looking for. And he finally asks, isn't there anybody else? And they say, well, there's little David. He's out in the back looking after the sheep. And when Samuel goes to see David, he realizes that David is the one whom God wants Samuel to anoint as the next king of Israel. And so Samuel does that. And all of that happens in and around, in and around Bethlehem. And um, so it becomes the ancestral home of David's family, David's household, as it were. And when we come to the New Testament, Joseph... Right, we're told in the genealogy this is from the house of David, and so in this census, everybody's supposed to go back to their ancestral home and get registered. Joseph brings Mary, pregnant Mary, down to Bethlehem because that is his ancestral home. 
and Jesus is born there. They're not from there. They are from Nazareth. Um, Mary visits Elizabeth in Luke 1. Um, in neither place, she goes to visit Elizabeth in a place that is now remembered as Ein Karim, what we'll talk about today. But, um, so it's, it's important, Bethlehem. What's disappointing about Bethlehem is that it's, I mean, I don't, I haven't had any kind of experience on the trip to Bethlehem. I don't think Patty has. I don't know that many people in our groups have, but it's still Bethlehem. It is. So let's talk about it. Okay, so we're on our way to Bethlehem, south of Jerusalem, not a long distance. It takes a while to get there because you got to go through all the checkpoints and things. So let me go back to my slides and see what I put here. Okay, here's the map again. We're going to cross into the West Bank. We're going to go to Bethlehem. Oh, he, Patty took this picture out the window of the bus, I think. That is just a photo of the wall. There's a big wall with check stations that separates Israel proper from the West Bank around Jerusalem. It is a substantial wall. And it has dramatically, if you keep up with this, with Israel, um, it, has it, it has basically ended the suicide bombings and stuff in Jerusalem that happened 20 years ago. Um, they put up the wall and it does its job. And um, Israel's a very different place and a much safer place. Um, tourism wouldn't be happening there, I don't think, without it. So, Scott, you yes. asked, how many generations are between David and Joseph? Okay, so the generations between David and Joseph in Jesus' genealogy, it's three fourteens. So you can multiply that out. It's There are three sets of 14 each. Now, the thing to bear in mind is that Jewish genealogies aren't necessarily complete. They were often constructed to tell a story. And so... Um, the story for Jesus' genealogy at the beginning of Matthew is from Abraham to David, David to the exile, and from the exile to um, to Joseph. And it's three sets of 14 begats. So, just, but, you know, there may have been more people involved, but, but that it's three sets of 14, so there we go. That's the most direct answer to the question. A lot of generations, a long period of time, from David to Jesus is a thousand years. Where was Plano a thousand years ago? I mean, Europe was still in the midst of the Dark Ages a thousand years ago, right? right. A thousand years is a heck of a long time. So it's a thousand years from David to, to, to Jesus, and a lot of things happened in between. Okay. Looking a little bright there, aren't we? <laughs> You'll see in a minute. I dialed it back. Okay. You're glowing. I know I'm glowing practically. Glowing. Yes. It's, it's, you know. Okay. So let me go back. Get myself. Okay. <laughs> so Patty takes pictures. So this is one she took. So when you get to Bethlehem, the bus parks, and then you walk a little ways to the Church of the Nativity. Along the way, Patty stopped a picture of the Stars and Bucks Cafe. You remember that, Patty? I thought it was so funny. It was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then she took, and I remember she took a picture of these lovely mannequins. I don't know why she took this picture, but... Because it felt like I was gone back in time to 1970. It was very strange. Yeah, and, yeah. All those and it's all on the little walk little from, the, are from where we left the buses till we get to the Church of the Nativity. When you approach the Church of the Nativity, you approach this big square, the square manger square, I think it's called. The, so that structure there that you're looking at, that is the Church of the Nativity down there. And I have a couple photos. Um, Patty took... Uh, uh, Robin Pratt sent me some. He, he's good with the camera. And just kind of looking around Manger Square. So this is when you're getting closer to the Church of the Nativity. Um, this is looking back behind you 
as you're approaching the Church of the Nativity at the square behind you. And at Christmas time, at least pre-COVID, it was it gets all lit up, and of course it's a big, big celebration. And the folks in the West Bank like it because it brings lots of tourists and and cash into the area. So let me go back. I'll just talk about the church for a minute. We spent a lot of time in Jerusalem talking about the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Okay? And I said, because it's the church that's over the place where Jesus was crucified and buried. And I said that the way that church came to be is that when Constantine became a Christian, his mother, Helena, made a trip to the Holy Land and went around asking where did all these things happen. And so she asked where Jesus was crucified. They showed her the spot. It was a spot on which the Romans had erected a temple which is part of the evidence for it being the spot that the Romans wanted to obliterate it. And so she had that spot cleared and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre erected there. She also went to Bethlehem and she said, where was Jesus born? And they said, well, right here. And so she had the Church of the Nativity built over that spot. And that is the church that stands there today. There, um, it was built in the 4th century. Much of it had to be rebuilt in the 6th century because of a fire, but it's still the same church over that spot. And since it was rebuilt, um, all that's happened to it, it's been added, the Crusaders added some things onto it, but it's still basically the church that had been there for, you know, 1,500 years. So we're going to enter it. Boom, this is what it looks like inside. It doesn't look like any, you know, the churches that we're used to. Um, it's an Orthodox church. Um, it is used today. We had a guide who was going to get married there. Was that the story, yes. Betty? Yeah, I've got a picture of him later. He was going to get married inside this church because he was a Palestinian Christian, our Palestinian guide. And it looks very foreign to us, right? It's It doesn't even look like a, a Catholic church. Um, this is part, you can see roughly in that area where some of the floor is taken up so you can see the, the older floor underneath, the mosaics and so forth that make up the, 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 the lower floor that goes back in time 1,500 years. Um, but this is kind of what the altar area looks like. And it's definitely not like any Methodist church I've ever been. And not even like Catholic churches. There's uh, so much stuff hanging down. So much just stuff up there. Oh, my goodness. If I go back, well, let's see. I think I did this this way. Okay. So here we are. This is in the center of it. Looking right down the center of the church. And there are porticos with columns to, the, to your left. And there are protocols with columns to your right. What happens when you go there is the line to go see where Jesus was born is all on the right side. And so behind the porticos, when it's busy, are these long mass of people waiting to go down steps to the place that is remembered as the place where Jesus was born. Very oh. long lines. Very long well, lines. Yes, I think we've waited yeah. over an hour yeah. each time. Yeah, and it's kind of crowded and pushy. But sometimes, remember one one trip, it was especially crowded and pushy. And we had some of the big guys in, in our group stand at the back and sort of make a make a line to keep people from pushing into our group. Because some of the folks, are they come from different cultures, and some of them are pretty pushy. Okay, so... You wait, and you, the line gets. You finally you get the line gets formed, and it gets narrower and narrower until you're pretty much single file, and you're going down these steps through this door to this. And there's a little altar over this place that is remembered as the place where Jesus was born. Is there any sense of it being the place where Jesus was born? No. You know, but it does. It does mark the spot. Again, it is the it, it's the devotional piece of this that I think is important to understand. 
more so than the archaeological piece of this. It is the, it is the devotional piece of, of this. And this church has been on this site since Helena went there in the 4th century. Here's our lovely Miss Patty. Um, you can see there were different coverings on the altar that day, but she's down at the same, at the same place. Um, a lot of people, you know, I think most Westerners who go, who make, who go down the steps and go into the place, they'll sort of say a quick prayer and sort of move on. But there are a lot of Russian Orthodox who visit this place. And they are very much into this, and and want to spend a lot of time down there. And um, I think they're probably more comfortable in the whole setting than we Westerners are, but in any event, that's Church of the Nativity. So I see Sandy Hussauer says, yeah, a lot of construction in 2016 and lots of people in line that were not particularly polite. Yes, there was, you know, the sad part is everybody's winning a line. We're all, I think, Christians. What are, Otherwise, what are we doing there? And you'll get up to where the this broad group starts to have to narrow and there is a lot of pushing and shoving and just you just go just like wow people 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 our guide and another guide remember they kind of gotten a yes our guide push. is trying to help us have a good experience and their guide is trying to help them have a good experience though the guides got in a shouting matches it was Your feet away from the spot that Jesus was born. It's feet away from the spot where Jesus was born. Yep. And there it's just well, we're going to talk about some of this in the next series. So, in any event. Okay, so Gary Brooks said I got to put my glasses on. We didn't say that. I have to put my, He says Gary Brooks says exactly, but it was very moving because if you can get in touch with the devotional piece of this Right? And realize that you are on the spot. That for nearly 2,000 years has been the spot where the, Jesus was born, the cave or the home or whatever exactly was going on. It's, it can be very moving. You just have to let yourself sort of tune out the busyness and the craziness and the crowds and, and, and just, just, just get in touch. There you go. So... I'm going to go back to the slides. So this is a picture of me with our Palestinian guide in 2016. What a nice, nice young man. He's the one who was, he was going to get married not too far after our time there. Um, a very, very nice young man. Um, like I said, he's Christian. It may surprise people that in the West Bank there are Christians, but yes, there certainly are Christians in the West Bank, just as there are a lot of Muslims in Israel. That world is its kind of different than most people think before they get there. So there I am, smiling away with our very nice Palestinian guide. Um, Patty noticed, she told me she, she thought he was a lot better looking than the previous Palestinian guide was. was that we had used in 2014. And a heck of a lot nicer. He was so nice. He's very nice, so very nice young man. Made us feel at home. And I don't know why I brought this slide. This is where we had lunch. I guess just to show you what it's like, this um, this was a very nice place. 2014 in the West Bank, lunch was kind of a mess. In my, I don't think I even got to eat that day. But this was really nice. This was a nice way to spend a little time visiting and... and Bethlehem. Visiting Bethlehem and, and so forth. And then <laughs> I brought this because... One of the one of the struggles on these trips is there are people on the trip. There's there's one group who fervently never wants to shop for anything, right? They want to visit stuff. There's another group who fervently wants to shop on the trip, so they have stuff to take home. And then there's a group in the middle. So trying to satisfy everybody as I try to do, we do make a stop in the West Bank at a shop owned by Palestinian Christians. And they have a lot of stuff there. You can shop there, take stuff home. But it's it's a beautiful place. Again, just 
very nice, very nice people. Um, make At least they make us feel glad that we're there. And here he is making, um, Craftsman is making camels or something out of olive, olive wood. Okay, so any questions about all of that before we go on to Ein Karim? Okay, so let's talk about Ein Karim. Not a, you know, it's an it's an Arab name, um, but it is the village that is remembered as because the village is not named in the Gospels, but it's remembered as a village in which Zechariah and Elizabeth lived. So um, let's talk about Zechariah and Elizabeth. It the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth is the first story in Luke's Gospel. It is the story that opens, for Luke, the story of Jesus' birth. And Zechariah is a priest. There were thousands of priests in Israel at the time. He is getting his one chance to go in and do the big priestly job inside the temple. Probably the only time in his life this old man has been able to do this. Probably, probably won't ever do it again. He and his wife, who's named Elizabeth, they are old and they are childless. And in their culture, that is a burden for her. There was shame associated on a woman who was childless. In addition to whatever sense that Zechariah and Elizabeth have of, of not being able to have children, there's a lot of societal pressure. And the two of them come from a village in the Judean hills that are on the west side of Jerusalem. Because what happens in Israel is we've seen the maps. Okay, so you start at the Mediterranean and you go in and it's all plains and flat and then it starts to rise and rise and rise. If you're in a car or a bus or truck, you're going uphill until you get to Jerusalem, which is 2,500 feet above sea level and then it all falls off down into the Jordan River, which is below sea level. So on the western side of Jerusalem, there are a lot of hills, there's a lot of pine trees. Um, it doesn't look anything like the eastern side of Jerusalem, which is basically this moonscape of wilderness, or further west of Jerusalem, where it's all plains, and you could see yourself planting wheat and it's all flat and the rest of it. So the Judean Hills is where um, this village is, and it is remembered as the place where Zechariah and Elizabeth live. And it's called, now today, it's called Ein Kerem. So there we can see them, my little white arrow. It's just west of Jerusalem. It's, you know, today we'd call it like a suburb or something, right? Um, So here's a picture. It's, in lo it's a lovely place, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, if you go up the spine of Israel, there are places that look like it because it's hilly, it's pines, it's above sea level, not as high as Jerusalem, but you're making your way up, up, up to the top um, there. And near the central square in the town is a well that is remembered as what they call Mary's well. It would have, the place where Mary would have gone and drawn water, I guess, when she was visiting Elizabeth. Because what we're told in Luke's gospel is that after um, Elizabeth, Zechariah and Elizabeth are promised a child, that happens in the temple when Zechariah is inside, the angel Gabriel also comes to this girl named Mary in Nazareth and tells her that she is going to have a child, except her child will be the son of God. And Mary goes to visit, at one point in this, Elizabeth, her kin, in this village. That's, that's the way the story is remembered. That's what the village is remembered as. And um, when the two women meet, okay, um, it's just a very, very powerful moment. One of the great moments in Luke's gospel, I think, when the child in 
Elizabeth's womb, she's about six months further along. Her, the child in her womb leaps at the entrance of Mary with the child in her womb. So that's where all this is happening. So there's the well, and then because it's a hilly, you make a long climb upward. A lot of, whoop, didn't want to do that. Climb upward toward this church. It's called the Church of the Visitation. Not by aliens, but Mary visiting Elizabeth. So it's a lot of steps to get up there. A lot of steps to get up there. But um, this is this is more of it. When in, there's a small chapel inside this church, um, and you can see in this mural those two women embracing one another are Mary and Elizabeth. And I find the whole place kind of touching. Mm-hmm. You know, would you agree with that, Patty? To- totally. Kind of surprising, yes. right? Because yes. you're typically we visit it like the last day. You've been doing this Israel thing for nine or ten days, looking at old stuff, right? Having moments, you hope, and you go to this church, you make this long climb up, and you're not expecting much, but you get up there, and it's like, it's beautiful. The chapel is lovely. The mural is lovely. There is a courtyard outside in which there is this, I find it a very striking, this is not a, the picture's not elongated, this um, this is the sculpture of Mary and Elizabeth. And then there are all these plaques about Mary that have come from Roman Catholic churches all around the world, a little bit like a church of the Holy Sepulchre, where they are arrayed on the walls around this, this, this courtyard up there at the chapel. And it's just lovely. It's just it's just a lovely a lovely place. And it's just cool to me that you know, um, Christians have taken all of these places in the Holy Land and have erected churches and chapels um, so that we can go and visit them and and see them and put this together in our own minds and our own hearts and hopefully be um, leave being being closer to God. There are a lot, I was reading a little bit about the agreements that are sort of in place and have been in place really for a very long time about how these places are shared, right? Um, because there's been a lot of different people in charge of these places over the, over the centuries, yet somehow these places have endured. You know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was, was really virtually destroyed once by a crazy Muslim ruler, um, but then later rebuilt by a Muslim ruler who had more sense and caring. And that's just sort of the history of, of this land that is, you know, claimed by, by so many. So I see that Linda Rivera said, important travel tip. <laughs> if you wondered where the best gelato in Israel is, Linda says it is near Mary's Well. But more importantly, it is a beautiful area with all of the plaques with so many different languages. Yeah, so that that's what that's what you can see in the background here are all these plaques. And it's just so cool. It reminds us that we are all part of a worldwide family. Or a part of a worldwide family, the body of Christ, you know, is not bound by, by skin color, language, ethnicity, borders, anything else. We are all one in Christ, and it's just I always appreciate being reminded of that when I visit these sites um, in Israel, where there are Christians from around the world have sent plaques in. Um, Yes, they're all Roman Catholic because this is a Roman Catholic site. The Roman Catholic Church runs most of these sites, but the Roman Catholics are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have disagreements with them about minor things, but with them we share our love of Christ and our devotion to being disciples of Jesus. So. What touched me a lot when we were there and also just looking in the picture is I never really thought about it before till I was there. There together are these two women, both of which are experiencing a miracle. 
at the same time. Because Elizabeth is way past childbearing way past years. Child, and, and she is having a child. Mary is the virgin who has been told that she's going to carry the Son of God. Right. And who these two men actually grow up to be. And how important, you know, as you know more and more about the Bible. I went to Catholic school. I did all that. I just, not until adulthood do I realize how important John the Baptist was. That he truly was the one who was out there spreading the news and preparing people, preparing the way for Jesus. And here the two women who were carrying those babies are together. And they're so joyful. Well, Mary's song, which is about her joy, about what is coming, about what is happening, which we call you know, the Magnificat, in, because it's in Latin, Bach put it to this amazing music. All of that happens at this little village. And this little tiny Right? Village. All of it happens right there. The two of them are together there. And um, I think most readers of the gospel think that Elizabeth is probably providing some shelter to Mary. Yes. This, this pregnant, not yet wedded relative of hers. Yes. Right? So, anyway. And this not yet born John leaps when Mary comes in that he already knows then he is still within the womb but who Jesus is yeah. and whose presence he is in. It's just kind of, just very moving. That's why I usually moving. tell people when we're traveling around Israel to, to in your little bag that you're going to have every day, have a small Bible that... I guess print's big enough you can read or on your phone, I guess so a lot of people do now, because you want to read some of these stories in the context of the places you visit, like that place, right? That's a good, as you're approaching the place, to read through the story of Mary and Elizabeth, it just makes it, it just makes it powerful and brings the two, brings the two together. So, okay, all right, so, Let's see. Where am I here? I and Karen. I just love that photo. Love. I just. I don't know. I like that place. I like the place. Okay. So I had a few other photos. <laughs> what I did was I went through Patty's library uh -oh. of photos. She has. <laughs> that woman has more photos on her phone than I don't know. But she. So I have. I brought a few that I thought would be a good closing to this seven-week journey through the biblical places. Um, I told you that we visit, when we go there, we usually stop at a winery, Golan Heights Winery. And, you know, and we do a tasting there. And I said that one time we were there, we had this, this, this old Orthodox gentleman who came and talked to us about wines. And you can see the tasting room there. It's all, you know, lovely. Very nice. But there's there's the guy. And see, he's got the tassels on his clothing and stuff, right? And um, he was quite a character talking to us about, about the wines. Um, and, you know, we had people bought them, had them shipped home. You can buy the wines here. Anyway, it's a, it was a nice little thing to do at the end of one of the days in Galilee. Um, this next one, what is, oh, okay. So this is, maybe I should let, we have this lunch. It's called the St. Peter's Fish Lunch. I should let Patty tell you this story. The microphone's on, Patty. Okay, the picture. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yes, we go to this restaurant. It's, it's an enormous size restaurant because our group is enormous and there are many, many other groups there are size. And you really don't order anything except a beverage. And this is kind of what they bring you. Um, a fish with the head, and all the bones, and french fries. Um, my son Robbie and Savannah and lots of other people, in my opinion, were very brave and ate it. Um, but you went for... I went for the filet. <laughs> 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 the fried fish fillet, which I have put a picture up of that you probably can't see it because of the delay. Yes, that that that's 
And it is very good. It's very good. <laughs> You're just kind of like, yeah, that is way more my style. Looks way more kind of like, I don't know, Captain D's or something. <laughs> the St. Peter fish. The yes. St. Peter fish. It's still the same fish. They've just done all the work for you. That's a good way to yes, think about it, isn't it, Patty? They've done all the work for you. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So what's... Okay. So this is from 2014, I think. Linda and Larry can help me with this. 2014. So so right up ahead on this street, if you look at the top of the photo, that is the garden tomb. We went there last week. That is the garden tomb. And the and the photo's taken from the bus. And we can't get there because there's this car that has stalled right in the street. So we could have just gotten out of the bus and walked up to the garden tomb, but no. We had a lot of Good Samaritans on the bus, and these guys poured off the buses that we had, and they got behind the car, and they all pushed it um, up ahead and parked it where the guy could, you know, it opened the street up and was a big help to the driver of the car. And I remember this, and they, yep, I'll just pawn off the bus to help them. 2016, Linda said. 2016, okay. Yes. I see you, honey. You're right there. Am I? Am yeah. I pushing? Am I off the bus? You too? are off the bus because I recognize your little cap, and I believe that is you all the way on the left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. We probably could have picked. There were enough of us. We probably could have picked up the cars. Right. Anyway, yeah. Um, so, let's see. The final thing I have for today in this series, just I only know about this because I subscribed to National Geographic History, and it had a little article about this mosaic map of the Holy Land that dates back more than 1,500 years mm. and is located in a building a church, I guess, in Jordan. So, and I brought a few photos of this mosaic map. It is the oldest map, actually cartographic map of the Holy Land that exists. Okay, and this goes back to about, um, like I said, 400, 500 AD. If you look at the top of this, you see what looks like, in the very top, you see what looks like a snake? Mm -hmm. That is actually the Jordan River pouring into the Dead Sea. Wow. Yes. And the white arrow is pointing to a round area on the map bordered by a little white line that is Jerusalem. And this is another photograph of just Jerusalem as it exists on this map. And you can see all of the lettering and place names and stuff that were put into this mosaic when it was created. Um, it's not all there. I think this is a reproduction. This is just a portion of what's there. But some of it, I think, has been lost. But I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool. I didn't even know the thing existed. They called the Madaba mosaic until a couple of days ago. And I just thought I'd bring a few photos of it to... to finish out our series so if you want to go on there are a lot of bible atlases okay i've got several on 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 the shelf behind me some of them get very very detailed um and are more references i think this one does is much more approachable and helpful and the the ivp atlas of bible history is a big book like it is it's like, let me pull these down. It's like this big. It's it's kind of large, right? You wouldn't carry it around any place. But it has lots of maps, lots of helpful things to get you oriented. This is the smaller version, the concise one. And gosh, it got dark again. Okay, so I urge people who go to Israel to get the IVP concise atlas of Bible history and spend time with it. And if they feel like they have room in their luggage to bring it on the trip because 
The more that you know about the biblical history, the more these places mean to you. The more sense they will make. The more you'll be able to tie it all together. The more you'll remember what you did. So I know that I recommended to our trip group that they listen to this series. I think we have quite a few that have been doing that. So, you know, a good resource to pick up. Both of these are available on Amazon. So, there you go. Okay, so... What's the next series, you might be asking yourself at this point? Okay, so the next series is going to be entitled God's Words. It's going to be entitled God's Words. So, um, what, because it is, gosh, it's getting dark in my house. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you want to put the light on behind us sure. just for grins? See what happens? Man, we're losing light here. Whoa! <laughs> <That's not> <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of light there, Patty. Anyway, we got this all messed up. That's why I don't ever use the overhead lights. It shines on my bald head. <laughs> <laughs> what bald so, head? You know, it occurred to me that e there are just so many words we use in church, in sermons, in class. I use them all the time. We don't really talk about what they actually mean. Like right now we're doing this series on Every Moment Holy. How much time do we spend actually talking about what we mean by holy, holy. holiness? Um, Arthur today was talking about Christian perfection. We need to talk about these things. And so we're going to talk about sort of the Christian vocabulary over the next however many weeks this last. And I think it'll be, you know, we've done a lot of Bible stuff in the last 18 months. A lot of, um, we did this series on Israel but we haven't done much theology stuff. So we're going to do some of that and un understand what these words are mean. So I hope all of you will stick around or invite your friends. I think it will be very helpful to you in understanding what we're doing in you church. You just cut me out. Did I? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to do That's that. That's okay. You better cut off that overhead light. I you know what so. it looks to... I've, You're shining. Yeah. He's an angel. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, there we go. That we're just gonna be semi in the dark here. We're pretending we're like here. out after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you guys. We appreciate you all tuning in for Scott's lesson again today, and I hope that you all have gotten a lot out of it. Um, I know I have. I've I've been and you've so been there blessed five be, times. Five times to be in Israel, and so so I. I'm just so blessed. And if I get to go back again, I will be thrilled. I only say that because you never know what's going to happen with anything. So um, I hope those that have been with us before kind of brought back good memories. And I hope the people that are going in the fall will be excited. And I hope everybody else j just got something out of it, seeing, you know, the history and the Well, most of us won't go, so you, but you can really... You can really make the Gospels come alive Absolutely. if you just put a little work into right. learning right. about Israel and the places and all the maps and all the rest of it. Absolutely. So, so you want to close this in prayer, I Norman? do. We see you next week with see you next week. God's Words or tomorrow with Exodus Tuesday. Yeah, we're at the ma in Exodus, we're 19. We're at the mountain of God. Big chapter. Chapter 19 is yes. big, big, big. And, and also on Tuesday... Um, we did start James last week. We know some people still were having issues with their home and everything else. But, you know, Scott's going to, I think we only went through like five verses, as you can imagine. So there's not a lot there's you a have lot to, to catch talk up. about in the book of James. <laughs> but I'm sure he'll even review those at the beginning. So please, if you would like, we'd love you to join us with us on Tuesday, too. So That'll be great. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all those gathered with us today. We are so grateful, God, that we have been able to remain a community of faith through the internet. I mean, who would have ever thought? And here we are, Lord. We're coming upon the one year anniversary where COVID kind of shut us down, you know, as a group, as a class, as a community, as a country, as a world. And we know, Lord, that right now, 
we are getting better. We are in better shape. We thank you, God, for the um, availability of the vaccines. And we know that a lot of people still don't have them, but more are on the way. And we just, we thank you, God, so much for that, that everybody who wants to get a vaccine will be able to get one. We, we are so grateful, Lord, for that. Um, we still, God, in our hearts, we still pray for those that have lost somebody very close to them over this past year, whether it's been through COVID or other reasons that they have not been able to celebrate that person's life. And we pray, God, that soon at the end of COVID, we'll be able to do that again. We do thank you, God, um, also for the amount of help that has been pouring into Texas to help Texans get over this terrible, terrible winter storm we had. We know, God, many of people we know, people from our class, people that are friends are still dealing with the aftermath of, of the broken pipes and the repairs that are needed on their house. And we just pray for them, Lord, all those that went through just really such horrible times, no drinking water. And we are very grateful, Lord, for the, the help that is coming in. And we, we just pray, God, for those that will still be going through this for many, many weeks or months to come. We love you, Lord. We are very, very grateful. And I do hope that we, we appreciate you, God, every day, as in Arthur's sermon this morning, that we actually stop for a moment and, and thank you, God throughout the day for all the little things that we take for granted but we shouldn't lord we thank you for sending the gift of your risen son jesus christ and it's in his name lord that we pray amen amen okay everybody adios Bye, stay guys. dry it looks like it's gonna rain here it sure does sure does can't get much darker Have okay a good day. bye bye bye